and the job title is helicopter crewman. And that was me. I was just like, do you know what? That's the coolest fucking job in the world. I want to do it. No, I was never single out to be like anything special because I was a chick. It was just a case of, you know, crack on lofting, get on with the job. It's a lot to ask, isn't it, of a 19 year old? When you open up with a minigun, it gives a bit of a kick. Liz, how are you, sister? I'm all right, thank you, Chris. How are you? <laughs> well, yes, all the better for seeing you. Yeah, it's good to see you yes. too. Yes, I thought I was doing um, a podcast with a member of the RAF and uh, it. Uh, then I thought I was chatting to Miss World. Oh, you're too kind. You're far too kind. <laughs> Is sorry, I, I am. I'm, I am trying to flatter you, but um, it, is that an issue in in the forces? Did you is uh, misogyny is what I'm getting at? Is it is, is that a a thing? A, yeah. No, I was really lucky. So, um, I mean, part of my well, most of my career, I was one of the only females that worked on Chinooks as a crewman, certainly. Um, mm. And for uh, four years, I was the only female. But um, no, I was never single out to be like anything special because I was a chick. It was just a case of, you know, crack on lofting, get on with the job. And yeah, I am. Um, I think that's one of the things the forces is actually pretty good at. If you're if you're good at your job and you've got the respect, then they just let you crack on. But it's like having 60 big brothers on the night out, like the ring of steel. It's like, <laughs> fuck off, lad. <laughs> Time to pull here. But no, they were, they were great. Can't, cannot complain. Yes, it's a bit like that at the minute with the, 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 the Royal Marines have now allowed female entrance. Yeah. Um, I think, and I don't think anyone's yet to get to, you know, get, get through, but I just know that, uh, should a female enter the fray, the boys are just going to treat them equally and, and, and not just equally, but they'll give them every support and incentive to get, to get through. It's just the way it, it's just yeah. the way it is. And I hope someone does. I mean, I'm a bit of a, whenever I first arrived at Odium as a crewman, um, seven squadron, which was the special forces squadron there, didn't have females. It was almost, I don't ever think it was written in, in black and white, but it was almost the unwritten rule that females, pilots and crewmen weren't allowed to go to seven squadron. Not just because, you know, the capability of operating on the back of the aircraft, but the nature of the job, you go and live in a crater with the shakies and the blades and you're, you know, pissing in a hole, shitting wherever. You know, it's not a good environment to have a female in there who's just, and I don't care what anyone says, having a female in the mix does mix it up. Um, it changes people's perception and stuff. And actually, if guys were on the job and, you know, one of the females went down, there's like an inbuilt chip, I think, in men to want to go and protect them. I, I mean, don't get me wrong, they still got the same kind of chip to go and protect their mates, their brothers, but um, there's a very strong, overwhelming thing to go and protect females. So I was quite happy not to go seven because I thought, you know, it's I wouldn't want to ever put the other lads in that position. So it never really bothered me. However, I do think that the rules have changed recently and now they do let females. I think the first two air crew are going seven at the minute. So mm -hmm. so that's, you know, it's not quite the Marines and the Paras, but it's still that special forces kind of over behind enemy lines. So yeah, all my hat's off to them. As long as they can do the job and do it well, then I wish them all the best. <laughs> yes, of course. And and so Liz, should we take it from the beginning? What what why did you decide to join the RAF? So I joined the RAF on my 19th birthday and I had no background in the forces whatsoever. My um, None of my parents or grandparents were forces, but my brother joined the army a year before me and he went up to a place called Palace Barracks in Northern Ireland um, to do his barb test, which is the entrance test into the army. And uh, there was a magazine on the on the table in the careers office at Palace. And uh, it had a guy hang out inside of a helicopter on a rope. Well, I thought it was a rope. So I said to the other chap, um, look, what's this job, this guy on the rope? And he said, well, for starters, it's a uh, wire. And the job title is helicopter crewman. And that was me. I was just like, do you know what? That's the coolest fucking job in the world. I want to do it. And I, do, I knew very little about it at the time. I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. So... 
applied to do it, went through some interviews at Pals Barracks and then got over to RAF Cranwell for like a, an initial interview. And then you come over for like uh, airman air crew selection. And that's like a series of aptitude tests. Like all the pilots go through it, air traffickers go through it. And my, my trade crewmen go through it as well. And then, yeah, you either get a yes, you're in or no, try try harder. <laughs> so I managed to get in. So I joined on my 19th birthday, straight from my levels at school. It's a lot to ask, isn't it, of a 19 year old? Yeah, well, I was really wet behind the ears. I mean, I had never been to England before. In fact, I think I've been over once for my brother's, uh, my half brother's wedding. I thought Leeds was near London because obviously all the big cities are near each other, aren't they? Um, and I'd never had a curry. You know, I was so young and naive. And when I look back at it now, I was just, I don't, I think that's half the, half of how I, I got on through training so well because I didn't know any better. It was just like, here's a hoop, jump through it. Okay. <laughs> and just keep doing that and, and, you know, try your best. And, mm -hmm. you know, with naivety comes enthusiasm, doesn't it? So I just threw my all at everything. Was it a case then of when he got into training, if you didn't achieve certain marks, you'd have been, I don't know, back in my day, we used to say parachute packer. You know, you'd be fucked off to do some other Yeah, other uh, trade. trade. Mm. Pretty much for air crew, you just got retreaded re on another course. So you'd get back course. So if you didn't make the, and the way our course runs, it's like a three month course um, with loads of leadership and stuff like that in it. And you end up going on an exercise, carrying pine poles around in your shoulder and making tripods for Hercules to come in on. And, you know, it's all these like leadership -y type things like cross the lava pit with a, three buckets and a plank of wood. But you don't know whether or not you've passed or failed until the very end of the course. And at the very end of the course, they call out your name. And if your name's called out, then you're recoursed. And if you're if you stood there at the end, then you've made it through. So it's pretty brutal. It's called Black Tuesday. Um, and yeah, you just get recoursed. So you get a second attempt at that. And then if it's don't get through the second time, then you're you're out. So And how how long is this period of time? So it's only three months. We do three months basic. It, I think it might have changed slightly now, but in my day it was three months and on the back of that, you come out as a sergeant because we had to, in theory, hold a rank in the forces where we could um, command the rear of the aircraft, so the, the cabin of the Chinook. So because, you know, 99% of the, the infantry would be a lesser rank, we came out as a sergeant so we could, in theory, order them around, which we never did. But, um, you know, when we were giving them briefs and stuff, at least we had the rank to hold on our shoulders. But what that also meant is that I came out of the RAF basic training after three months as the rank of sergeant <laughs> which at the ripe old age of 19 is a lot to carry on your shoulders and the RAF used to nickname us the plastic sergeants because that's exactly what we were <laughs> we had no clue but um you very quickly grow into it when certainly when you get to a war zone let's put it that way I should have been awarded the rank of sergeant when I left <laughs> training I was bloody brilliant yeah no it's um I was a very, uh, you know, a very crap sergeant in all other respects, but uh, not bad at being our crew. And Liz, forgive me, but the reason I started my podcast isn't just to chat to fascinating uh, characters like yourself, but also just ask all those questions that like I'd never get to ask. Um, it, no, it's not probably what people think. It it's food in the RAF. <laughs> It's legendary in the British military that the RAF have like I should give a shout well, out we, here to I, I just I'm just gonna give a shout out to Royal Marine Chefs because they really looked after us and, and the Royal Navy as well. When I was on ship, they spoiled us rotten, you know. On ship? Oh, I've yeah. been on before and it was not to get the best but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But um, no, we used to have, we have a joke with the officers in the RAF that they have swan ciabatta for lunch because it's so posh in the officers' mess. I can't say that the food I ever had was, oh, it was always all right, you know what I mean? But most of the time whenever I was eating in a mess, it was because I was deployed somewhere. So it was it was generally not the RAF chefs. It was someone from the army or, you know, Fijians or something making some crazy food. But no, it, was, it wasn't bad. It's probably mm -hmm. slightly better than the army, I imagine. But it's now okay. as you starve. So the, the whole system's changed now. And instead of just going in and filling your boots on a Friday afternoon with fish and chips, you have to pay for it now. So I think everyone's pretty disgruntled in the forces now. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not good. We'll, we'll come on to that. My God. Yeah. Yes. Um, did did I read, did you do 10 tours of Afghanistan? Or uh, uh... Yeah, yeah. I did um, 
two deployments to Iraq. And then I went to Iraq when I was 21. So I was the youngest air crew to go to Iraq. Um, and I mean, that was after the war. Finally, it was just routine tasking then in 2004. Yeah, three. And then back again in 2004 and then went to Herrick in 2005 and did 10 Herricks. But unlike the Army and the Marines would have done is that we, you guys did six month tours. We only did three months because we had to keep our currencies back here in the UK. So we had to come back to like simulator check rides and like learn our emergencies and stuff like that. Um, so we did three months at a time. But because of that, it meant it came around every freaking year. So it was relentless. Yeah. It was like, I'm, I should have bought property out there because, you know, I spent that much fucking time there. <laughs> Jeez, that's still the best part of three years in in, in theatre. Yeah. But the Yanks do like a year. Some of them do like a year and a half. We I remember going out to uh, Kandahar, coming back to the UK and going back out again for my second round. And the same guy was in the passes office at the Taliban last stand at CAF. And I was like, you've been here since I left. And he went, yep. And that, the Yanks are just crazy uh, how long they do. But they love it. <laughs> and when you are, uh, I want to talk all about the uh, uh, Chinook, but the weapon systems, how does that work? Because I only know from my time in the military how to fire. I mean, I fired rifles, pistols, machine guns, uh, yeah, machine guns, submachine guns, et cetera, et cetera, and a rocket launcher and this sort of stuff. But right. you, 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 you're firing like some pretty hefty weapons. Yeah. Yeah. So the Chinook's got fitted uh, on the ramp an M60, and the M60 is essentially what they use in the Vietnam War on the Hueys, on bungees out the door. So we have that fitted to the ramp. And the reason why it's on the ramp is because you can basically fit it and remove it with a pit pin. It's really quick. So you can like take it off, get a land over in, put it back on again. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the front on the left and right hand door, uh, we've got a minigun, which always used to make me laugh why it's called a minigun because there's nothing mini about that thing. It's huge. Um, so the minigun fires 3,000 rounds a minute of 7.62 which is essentially looks like a lightsaber show. It is, I mean, it just destroys Hiluxes in seconds, which I can witness firsthand. But, um, and the M60 is about a thousand, uh, yeah, the sustained a thousand rounds a minute. So it's um, it's all right. It's nowhere near as good as the the minigun, but um, yeah, it, we're, we're pretty well protected and we look after our troops pretty well if we need to. <laughs> mm -hmm. what, what, I'm, what I'm interested in is, is how do you, train on a on a weapon like that do you, do you do you go on the range or yeah there's a couple of um air to ground ranges in the uk mostly up the east coast actually and some just off the the west coast of wales so we would on a you know pre well, on a pre herrick kind of training pdt we would head up to the east coast and spend a whole day doing day and night gunnery um and I mean, it's really quite funny. One of the old ranges up there was a range called Donanook and it just used to have seals all over it and seal pups. So it was like, you know, you'd get up there and you'd be like, right, lads, they're not targets. We're going to have to go find somewhere else. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then it, the good thing about doing gunnery up in that kind of neck of the woods was we'd do day and tonight and then we'd usually come back through the heli lanes and fly down the heli lanes to get back to Odium, where we're based from. So that was always a pretty nice way to end what was essentially a whole day sitting around in the back of an aircraft, listening to mini guns, and then having your like 10 minutes on the on the gun and then sitting back down again while everyone else had theirs. So they're, they sound great, but they actually could be quite boring. But um, we, we do some training in California as well, where we had to train desert training. So it was a lot of dust landings and stuff like that. But there's a range in America, uh, in California, and it's a 360 range. So we had all three guns going at once. So um, that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And do you have to achieve like a level you know to pass you'd like to think so wouldn't you chris but no uh well we have gunnery instructors i was a gunnery instructor so you just have to assess that, that whoever's it's more about their handling of the weapon and their handling with the emergencies and stoppages than actually whether or not they can hit the freaking target which mm. i mean nine times out of ten that's what we practice for but truth is if you're in herrick and you're contacted you're either arriving a landing site or departing a landing site. And as soon as you call contact, wherever that's going to be, the first thing the pilot's going to do is pull in power and overshoot So um, or maneuver. So, I mean, you don't have this lovely straight and level flight that everyone dreams of to sort of, you know, hose stuff down. You're either left and right and all over the place. So, um, 
yeah, we, you know, we practice our best, but truth is that you're going to have to walk your tracer on no matter what happens. <laughs> how 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 do you simulate that when you're on the range? Is I mean, when we, we... like that, get the pilots to do overshoots. So we would come in, and as the gunnery instructor, I'll call contact five o'clock, contact at one o'clock or whatever, and then the pilot will overshoot, and whoever's on the gun will then try and walk onto the target. Ah, so you're actually in flight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, did you I mean, ever did you ever fire it static just to I don't know get yeah. get get you Yeah we um I mean a lot of the range stuff is will work the guys certainly the guys that have never shot the weapon before because when you open up with a minigun it gives a bit of a kick and it's it's loud and just to kind of let the guys who've never shot one before have a go we'll sit in the hover and just shoot at one of the I mean some of the things on the range are like landowners barges that kind of thing um so we'll just let them sit in the nice and steady hover without the wind flow because even as well as the aircraft maneuvering you've got the wind coming to across the front of the gun so you've got this thing called trajectory drift which is a bit gunnery kind of ta- um sort of um, speak but essentially if you're firing the rounds as they come out of the end of the weapon and they go into the airflow they're going to spit off to the right so you have to aim off slightly to the left so we let them practice all that in the hover and then we let them go around at like 40 knots 60 knots 80 knots and then once they've got their head around that then it's like all the fun and games starts and it's overshoots and and then they have to do the same at night and at night time we've got an IR laser that lights up the target but again you're trying to manage with your hands not just the triggers but your IR laser and your intercom button as well. So it's like you're trying to be like Dr. Octopus with all your fingers because you just can't can't trigger everything at the same time. But uh, most of them are pretty good. It's not it's not that hard. And with respect to the flying aspect of the Chinook, did it, like did you pick any of that up or is that like nothing to do with you? Do you... In terms of being a pilot and uh, actually handling the aircraft? Yeah. Uh, No, I got offered a lot. I got offered loads of times because we train in the simulator as well. So we do a lot of our flying trainer in the simulator. There's one at Benson and there's now one at Odium. And uh, we train for all our emergencies in there. So we'll go in for like a two hour sortie and the crew will sit in the back. Pilots will jump in the front and they can be quite mundane because we're always training the same kind of things. There's like a couple of mandatory emergencies. In fact, there's six of them and you always train the same six ones. Um. So it used to get quite boring. So the odd time the pilots would be like, Liz, do you want to jump in the front and have a go? And I'd be like, mm. so I had a couple of goes. I was pretty crap at it, if I mean, honest. It was not my bag. But um, over my career, a few people said, do you not fancy retraining, Liz? Because I had time on my side because I joined so young. And a few people said, do you not fancy like becoming a pilot? I was like, why would I do that? And you know, being a crewman is the best job in the world. And I honestly think sitting on the ramp with your feet dangling over the edge, even Afghanistan, which is a war zone, watching the sunset in the heat, feet dangling over the edge, tasking day is over and you're heading home. And that's the best seat in the house because you don't have to think about things. You don't have to worry about a call sign. You don't have to work, worry about any other stuff. You can just watch the world go by. And I mean, same coming through London, like I mentioned earlier, the London Hellions, nothing beats sitting on that ramp waving at people in, you know, Canary Wharf and as you go past the London Eye and like you're a rock star and and there's no way I'd want to swap that for being a pilot who's strapped to the front of the thing like a taxi driver. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely mm-hmm. I think the better job. And what about, what's the drills then for crash landing? What what if there's a, uh, you know, a engine malfunction? I mean, I'm just going to chuck some silly stuff at you because I reckon people at home like me would, want to ask you do you have parachutes on board or or is that no nothing like that so the good thing about the chinook is there's nearly a redundant system for everything so there's you know two engines and we can essentially lose an engine on a chinook and the other one will keep the rotors turning so it's not like one engine controls one rotor both engines control both so you can you lose an engine you could uh hydraulic systems have all got a backup um and even the rotor blades, I mean, I've seen people take a foot and a half off the end of one of the rotor blades in a confined area. And the thing, you know, the Chinook still continues to fly. It just flies like a bag of nails. But it's a really, it's a, called a battlefield hel- helicopter for a reason. It's really robust. Mm-hmm. Um, and because there's so much redundant space in the middle of it, unlike the Puma, if the Puma takes enemy fire, you're more likely to hit something really important, like the combining gearbox, the cockpit, and all the important stuff's all jammed in a really small area. On the Chinook, it's all really spread out. So, I mean, I've been pepper-potted loads of times in theatre. 
and you hear the tink, tink, tink as the rounds come into the aircraft and they can literally fiddle you up, but they'll not hit anything important. But obviously if they do, um, we're all trained. Uh, the and crewmen, so my role, we're trained how to manage a lot of the emergencies down the back so we can service the aircraft if we land away somewhere we can do AFs and BS which is after flights and before flight servicing and we can pretty much put most things back together with help from the engineers mm-hmm. um so that's why we're kind of specced up to be basically essentially ground engineers that can fly um but the pilots I mean that's why we do the simulator like I was talking about earlier that's where we train to do if there's an emergency we've got these FRCs and we go through them and uh you know the the pilots that's what they get paid their money for is a lot of the immediate react, uh, immediate actions, which are something happens, they've got, you know, 10 button presses they need to do instantly and then we'll start backing them up. So, yeah, it's a pretty good helicopter. Liz, I'm probably going to lose myself here, but I, I, I said to you before, it, this is your podcast and I don't want to go any further before mentioning your book. Oh, yeah. Because people have only got, you know, half an hour to watch this. Um, we want them to know that you've got a book out. Yeah. Uh, is that your, was that your title, Chinook Crew Chick? Yeah, that's what the lads called me. So I was a crew man. That's um, that's the that's the title of the job I did. And thankfully, it's like still being preserved. Is that no, no PC? People have got hold of it yet. So we're not crew people yet. We're still crewmen. Mm. And I always wanted to stay like that. Um, But yeah, the lads used to refer to me as the crew chick or uh, Doris was pretty much what I got called most of my career, um, which is actually a really affectionate term. It's not, you know, some people were like, oh, Doris, is that not derogatory? Not really. I always used to love being called Doris, so never bothered me. But yeah, Krujek is, and the book's called Chinook Krujek. Mm. My dad calls people Doris. He, he loves it. <laughs> yeah, and my, my squadron mug had Doris on it, and it, I did not mind at all. It was it was brilliant. We had about, we had a couple of Dorises by the end. By the time I left, there was three or four female crewmen, and I was Doris number one, and then there was Doris number two and Doris number three. <laughs> but it never really caught on the same with them as it did with me. So, yeah. We'll come on to the uh, writing because, like I said earlier, uh, Liz, uh, it's uh, that's an incredible achievement in it, 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 <laughs> in it, in itself. Um, yeah. I just wanted to mention it. Now, uh, uh, I just wanted to give that a sh- your book a shout out now. Um, so, yeah. So get into the nitty gritty. At, at what point in theatre did it all get very real? So the first, when I did my first debt in Afghan, I mean, Iraq was pretty quiet for me. Iraq, I, I mean, it still felt a bit playground, really. And I'm not saying it wasn't busy for the infantry and certainly the, uh, a lot of the uh, re- regiments that went there as we withdrew as an Air Force. Um, we're getting IED'd all the time. There was loads of IDF at, at Basra and there was, a, a, I think there was a couple of, of um, people killed in Basra. But not when I was there. When I was there, it was very quiet. So then when we went to Afghan, uh, the first couple of deployments I did, we were based from Kandahar and Bastion was essentially just a barbed wire fence. It was just literally a barbed wire fence in the middle of nowhere. And we were under slinging all the, the you know, Pa- uh, pallets with full of stuff we were like drums with wire cabling on it step ladders all the stuff that built bastion essentially got taken there by chinook either underneath in an iso container or inside so again that wasn't really that busy the first couple of deaths because we only had troops in sangin garesh and lashkagar and a couple all the way up north in kajaki but none of the fobs were there you know none of that existed and 2006, that's kind of when things started to flip a little bit. So uh, the Paris got, um, had a really tasty debt in Sangin. Um, now Zad started to kind of rumble around in the background and Musicala. And then we started to have more British troops pushing up Helmand. Um, and it's, it's inevitable, isn't it? The more British troops you have on the ground, the more kinetic it's going to get. So from 06 onwards, it started to get really kinetic. And the, the, the biggest thing then obviously we noticed is the MERT, which is the Medical Emergency Response Team which is essentially the flying ambulance, went from being, you know, one, maybe two shots a week to, I mean, my worst day was six, uh, 14 shots in one day. So it was like scenes from MASH, you know, and I always said that and I said, it's not an exaggeration. We would be bringing nine liners in, dropping them off at um, Nightingale HLS, which is at Bastion, and on the way back in, getting another nine liner on the radio and going straight back out again. So um, what's, the, what's a nine liner? So a nine liner is how the British troops report a casualty and it's a really like um 
it's a, a format that everybody uses so that it, there's no mess, like nothing's lost in translation and it's a really clear format. So it's like call sa- grid, call sign, and um, the the nature of the injury or the categorization of the injury. So T1 is you need this guy's dying, you know, you need to get here now. T3 is walking wounded and T2 is somewhere in between. So quite often we would get maybe a T2 and it would become a T1 while we were on our way there. You know, the injuries would get worse. Or um, we'd get a shout for maybe a T1 and en route, we would find out there's actually a T1, a T2 and three T3s because it had been a tick, which is troops in contact. So it was never, I mean, most of the information we would get, the nine liner would come in to Bastion HQ. It would get phoned straight through to the back phone, which is the tent we were holding the response in. So we would basically sit in a tent all day um, on not- 15 minutes notice to move. Although it never took us 15 minutes to get airborne. I think my quickest was less than five minutes. Um, but yeah, so we'd get the nine liner. We'd run out to the aircraft. The medics would come out with us and the force protection guys would spin the thing up as fast as we physically could and then just head to wherever the grid was. And then the crewman, and my job was to be on the TAC radio. So we'd be on the TAC radio back to, um, battle, well, Bastion effectively, which is the HQ they'd get more information and pass it to us. And then eventually we would flick over to the, the troops on the ground and we'd speak to them on the net and they would give us even more detailed information about the nature of the injury of the casualty. So we'd land on, ramp goes down, combat medic would run out into the six o'clock, meet the casualty and the stretcher and the stretcher bearers. And then it was kind of get whatever on board. So, I mean, they used to come back on with, you know, I've seen stretchers go past with literally torsos on them, you know, legs missing, arms missing. Um, and that goes from not just British soldiers, but, you know, Yanks, um, Dutch soldiers, but also Afghan locals, you know, kids, you know, coming past in pretty bashed at ways. Um, I also once got tasked to shout where uh, it was a troops in contact and we had to go and pick up the guys. I think it was Paris had been um, hit and and the ta- a Taliban soldier. So that in itself brought a real moral conflict of like, like it's his fucking fault that these guys are, you know, in the way they are, but we still had to take him back to Bastion, mm. uh, which says a lot about, you know, you know, the command element in there when they actually said, yeah, bring the bring Taliban back, you know, human life is a human life, essentially. Um, but yeah, so Mert was pretty tasty for those couple of years, definitely. Mm. Going back to the... Um the first taste of so liz i just explained like when we went out uh, my experience of combat was belfast um yeah not not far from you (laughs) right and um i remember going out the camp gate for the first time you pepper pot like you know you're running running like hell to avoid the you know potential sniper and that and nothing like happened for a week it was just oh is this it is this going to be like our six month or our, oh, i think it was a five month tour is it just going to be walking around the streets <laughs> right? and then bang when it went off oh my god it was just like such a freaking awakening yeah boom like that and so much stuff going off you know, these guys getting hit up here on top of the blocks of flats. Um, we were, we, we got hit twice in, in the same day. We got blown. Uh, well, a, 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 a bomb went off and then the chap behind me got, got, got hit. And what was the moment for you when you first had to get on the gun and start giving it back? So I, used to refer to this as my normality bar so when i was in um iraq it because it was a bit quieter we would go into things like um uh, basra palace or shatla arab hotel was there and the end brief was like this place was mortared last week and i'd be like wow that's dangerous and then the next time you get briefed it's like oh this place was mortared yesterday so you think mm, even more dangerous and then the next thing it was mortared that morning and you'd still be going in so your your normality bar for what was like danger really slowly crept up so it wasn't like I went straight into the thick of the fight. It was like really slowly, the danger kind of got nearer, but it became more normal. And then the same in Afghan, like Noizad was a classic example. Every time we landed on a Noizad, we'd be mortared within seconds. But that became like almost a game to us to like get everything loaded and get the fuck out of there before you got hit. Mm-hmm. And then 
and then aircraft started getting hit. Now, the first time I had to return fire was actually on a really benign um, routine tasking day, which is just a routine tasking in Afghan is just where we're moving troops and rations and whoever needs to go around the, the area to different landing sites. And it was somewhere just southeast of Lashkugar, actually. Um, and yeah, we got just got built up on the landing site and we were sort of mid loading people. But the problem with when you're on the land, when you're already on the deck, you can't get the range and the weapons, you can't get your sights on. So all you have to do is sit there like an innocent bystander while you watch the dust get kicked up around the aircraft until you can then lift and, uh, and return fire. But again, it's your normality bar and suddenly I f- you find yourself n- not even being worried that you're being shot at because you think, well, it's, at least it's not high caliber. And again, you always got a, at least it's not. And and that's where I think it's really a lot. So that I was lucky in that respect, but we also had a lot of crewmen who came behind me who were sort of parachuted into Afghanistan as their first debt. And it was right in the middle of that, like 2006 onwards kind of era. So not only had they just come fresh out of training, but they were now getting shot at um, and picking up dead bodies and limbs and all sorts of stuff with not that chance to kind of ease into it. So a lot of those guys find it really hard. But I think by the end of my debt, my last um, merch shout, and this is how I knew that my perception of normal was a little bit skewed. We picked up an American who'd been killed and he got carried on the back of the aircraft. And then the Yanks handed me his foot in a clear plastic bag and said, here's his foot. And I was like, okay, cool. Just put it down beside me. Like no emotion um, because it becomes so routine then. And you just think like, I even telling this story, it sounds so fucked up, but at the time it was like, well, it's just his foot. Stick it down there. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think. Your normality bar is a good thing to get you into the, you know, ease you into combat. But also essentially when you become so normalized to it, that's when the damage is really starting to occur. Yeah, Liz, my gosh, there's so much we can say there. Um, But in that theater, it is normal and you've done really well. You know, that's what you do that. I guess the secret a secret <laughs> the you know the thing for for veterans who've been in that level of intensity is you know how how to switch it to civilian life isn't it you know yeah i mean the secret i think was to not overthink it you know yeah was- yeah yes yes that's what that is what yeah. i was trying to say Whenever we were, you know, collecting and scooping these guys off the battlefields, um they'd go into Bastion Hospital and and we would deliberately wouldn't go and follow it up, you know, uh, unless we knew it was a really positive outcome. Uh, but most of the time we didn't really want to know because we knew, well, we did want to know, but we just knew it'd be so detrimental on our health and our mental health to see the actual, because whenever the you know, casualties on, on board the aircraft, they're essentially just a really precious piece of freight. And it's our job to get them back to that hospital as quick as we can. But there's no, there's no name, there's no personality, there's no, family at home to think about that's just a piece of freight to get it back so we deliberately didn't ever really chase that other side of it up and that's where I came really unstuck during lockdown because I I, you know I'd always not overthought it and then when we got locked down in 2020 I had none of my coping mechanisms were there my coping mechanisms for a shit day at work were always like go for a run go for a long long run or you know head out with mates on the piss and that was all taken away from us during lockdown so I found myself really with nothing else but my own thoughts and I developed insomnia. And I remember one night looking up the back catalog. I had my logbook out and I was looking up the names of the guys that I picked up on IRT shouts that had died and like discovering like, you know, where they had they got fiance, did they have kids, all that stuff. And it, I knew at the time, like big red signals going, Liz, this is fucked up behavior. But I did nothing. I just carried on regardless. And I knew I was coming really unraveled and really going down a slippery slope. Uh, into a very dark place and um, just didn't want to be a burden to anyone. So I didn't really let on to any of my friends that this was happening. And it got worse and worse and worse until I ended up in 2020 taking a a massive overdose with the sole purpose of going to sleep forever uh, and and not waking up again, just to quiet the voices that were going, not the voices, it wasn't really voices, it was just chatter and noise that was in my head at the time. But yeah. obviously, I, I survived. So I'm here to tell the story. Thank God. Yeah, I was going to say, don't, don't do that again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't recommend it. Let's put it that way. But no. um, you know, hopefully, the, the the second half of my book is very much a 
a lesson in life to you know people who are going down the same slope as I was to say you know just just tell someone just grab someone and it doesn't matter who it is and just say I'm really struggling mm-hmm. um I you know I, I I know I give my mental health a number you know when people say how are you today I'm like well oh, maybe six and that's a lot a lot easier I think for people to say than going oh I'm fine yeah I'm just fine or I'm, I'm having a shit day it's sometimes easier just to give it that scale of one to ten you know I'm a three could you know some days are two, but you know, getting there. So, giving a number is my advice to people. Gosh, pause. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, oh Liz, I, 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 you, you're doing, uh, you, you, you've been through so much. You, uh, it, it's, it's insane, isn't it? We're having this conversation about stuff that it, it it's just all bizarre. I mean, most people will. And I don't mean this patronizingly, like we'll never have experienced what you've been through. Um, I mean. But I feel very privileged to have been through it. You know, yeah. I feel that, like being on Mert and picking up soldiers on their last journey out of the battlefield was an honor. It really was. I always say that, you know, it was the best of times and the worst of times, but it was a privilege and an honor to be part of that. And I think, you know, if I if I could have anything in the world, uh, you know, people say, would you have an eternal life or a million pounds or whatever? I'd have a rewind button and go back to the start and do it all again because I loved every second of it. Even the stuff that has left me with the, you know, the, the fuck ups that I have in my head now, it was, that's what makes you a colourful person, isn't it? You know, the, yeah. the the bad times and the good times are, are what makes, you know, the tapestry of life, isn't it? So um, I would still go back and do it all again. And uh, yeah. I can't, you know, I have no regrets. I am really, I'm really lucky in that respect. You know, people say, oh, do you not regret the day you tried to take your life? And I'm like, well, no, because I think that had to happen. I think like a glow stick, you have to break to really start to, you know, come out the other side and shine. And I think I had to get to that point in life to then start my next journey of the recovery, putting all the files back in my head where they needed to be. And part of that really was not just, chucking everything back in where I'd locked it away for years. It was reading the files and acknowledging the trauma on them and it, like almost accepting that it's normal to feel sad about that or, you know, all that stuff that I've seen. It is, it was pretty horrendous, but it was so easy at times just to wash over it and kind of go, oh, well, it was just a job. And it, it, you know, it took a long time to kind of go, yeah, well, that was pretty, pretty awful, uh, mm-hmm. but it's still an honor. So yeah, no regrets whatsoever. Hey, do you know I learned my favourite expression? I think it was earlier this year. It was a it was a film actually. It was a western. Oh, hang on, I've got things popping up on my screen. It was a western, Liz. Um, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what. But you remember at the end of the podcast. No, but the, <laughs> the the expression was, "What we lose in the fire, we'll find in the ashes." Very true. Yeah. Just, like just, that is life. You I'll know? be my next tattoo then, we'll do it. <laughs> hey, let's get a joint one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have ha- I'll have half of it. You can have the other. Yeah. I'll be <laughs> I'm saying like here, that would be, a, that, that would be a bit weird, but. <laughs> I'm covered in them. I'm covered in them. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, Liz, tell me, the Chinook, what an incredible machine. What makes it special? So I think from my, whenever I was at Palace Barracks doing my um, initial duty come across, going way back to the start of the podcast, um, I was driving in the main gate and I pulled in in my little green Corsa that I had at the time because it was only 17. And a chin came right over the top of the car into the into Palace Barracks. And I remember looking up and just seeing the belly of the aircraft just went right over the top of me and it literally shook, you know, it shakes your body to pieces, doesn't it, a Chinook? And thought that that's that's what I want to be on. And it was only years later, whenever I actually had eventually got through all my training. Um, and as you go through training, you get given like a dream sheet, and you can write the aircraft that you want to go on in order. So at the time, the RAF were operating search and rescue. Um, so that was Sea Kings, there was Pumas, there was Merlins, and there was Chinooks. And I used to put Chinook, Chinook, Chinook down as my option one, two, and three. But it was when I eventually got posted Chinook. Um, Someone said, yeah, but they used to hardly ever go into Palace Barracks it, because it was such a small landing site. They never used to go in there. So I, 
I still look back on that day and think, I wonder if it was a sign or if it was one of those you know, classic moments in life that changed the direction and the path I was on. But if you're going to be a crewman, it's the only aircraft to be on, in my opinion, because we, I mean, we've got a huge cabin floor, you know, fit in two Landovers, a Landover and a trailer, a 105 gun. Um, what we can't fit inside goes underneath and we've got three hooks, whereas all the other aircraft have got one and we can lift up to 24 and a half tons which is huge. So if you're going to learn your trade, you might as well go on the, you know, the, the one that challenges you the most mm-hmm. and gives you the, you know, the most to do. Uh, don't get me wrong. Most days in Afghanistan, you put the ramp down and it's like a bad game of Jenga trying to fit everything in because none of it reflected the tasking sheet. You know, you'd be told you're going somewhere to pick up like 10 troops and a stepladder and you'd arrive and there'd be like 24 troops, three locals, a donkey, a stepladder and a couple of drums of oil. And you're like, oh, what the hell am I going to put all this? <laughs> but we always find a way. Um, and that's where the Chinook, you know, as a crewman, there is no other aircraft you want to work on. Um, and like I've referred to earlier as well, it's it's a battlefield helicopter that looks after you. You know, it's got the beefiest weapons and, you know, everything on there. If, if it gets hit, it's still going to get you home. Mm. So it's the sound of freedom. That's what the troops call it. And it's very true. Liz, who make who makes it? It's Boeing. So it's Americans. It's- yeah. Boeing in America. So I've got a couple of friends now who were crewmen in the Air Force. Now work for Boeing here in the UK. Um, wearing a blue flying suit now instead of a green one. And they spend most of their time out in Philadelphia having a great time because that's where the HQ is. I remember my kind of, I don't know what you call it, you know, reintegrating into society. There's a lot of weird stuff, you know, when you're a forces person, especially if, well, not especially if you're a bloke, but for example, I mean, just a silly example. It took me a lot of years to realise if you had a disagreement with someone, you couldn't just like beat them up <laughs> yeah. or or attempt to beat them up. You know, I'm I'm being serious. I had some quite physical altercate. Is that the right word? Oh, you know, yeah. I remember. You know, I'm not 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 even gonna <laughs> not even gonna go there. You know, <laughs> it, it it took a long time to, you know, uh, find your re- drive again. Yeah, yeah. I I struggled those as well. I found, um, I went to work for a disabled flying charity when I came out who were amazing because they flew a lot of veterans that actually were wounded injured soldiers who had come off, you know, the Afghan campaign and Air Ability, which is the charity, had scholarships for these guys, uh, helped with Help for Heroes, but a lot of other, Boeing provided one and a lot of other um, big companies. So that kind of gave me a sense of purpose again. But yeah, sitting in the office, like I swear like a champion and, you know, calling someone like the ginger kid was like, you can't say that, Liz. And, you know, the banter that we have as forces people doesn't automatically translate to Civvy Street. And I was very lucky with their ability because they kind of got me. But I, I always used to say that I think if I worked for a proper Civvy company, I'd be sacked within weeks because... I was almost my own worst enemy in terms of I'd call someone Doris and they'd be like, but you're a girl, Liz, you can't call her Doris. And I'd be like, well, she is a Doris. And I was almost so negatively uh, PC for a female that I thought I'll get sacked if I was in a civvy job. So yeah, it's taken a while, but I know I work with a lot of military people again as civvies, but it's, it's really hard to make that transition. Really yeah, but, but But particularly for you, because... I've got this image in my head, right? Of, like you're stepping through a doorway and you've got some poncy bloke going, oh, hang on, I'll, I'll get that for you. And like he will have no idea that he's lived a shitty, pissy, crap life, <laughs> you know, in front of a computer screen. And like actually you've been boom. Yeah. Living I, uh... a, you know, in the thick of it. And does that ever, is that like ever a clash? Do you ever oh. like feel like grabbing someone and say, oi, buster, actually, <laughs> uh, or is that an ego? Uh, uh, well, I mean, it's, it is ego and we've that's something yeah. we've, we've all got to get a control of. I just like to quietly surprise people. So, I mean, I'm still, I'm not, I've never been a macho girl. And, you know, if a bloke holds a door open for me, I still think that's just nice manners. You know, I'm never going to go, I can get my own door. You know, I just think it's nice when people do that for you and I'll hold a door for a girl or a guy. But, uh, so I'll never be one to kind of, you know, lick a gift horse in the mouth, so to speak. And, uh, but I do like, 
quietly surprising people. Uh, so when you eventually get chatting to them and they ask what you previously did and you tell them. I was in a taxi last week in London going to the big chin reunion that we have every year and it, in a like, like little dress, hair curls, high heels on. And the guy asked what, I did, what you know, a little bit about me and I got chatting and I said, are you spinning forces? And he said, oh, what did you do? And I started to tell him and he's like, just cannot believe that that's the same person sat in a taxi. But it's nice to surprise people. And usually somebody else butts in before me and says, do you know what she used to do? So I've had that a few times at like nights out and dinners and things that people have gone. <laughs> people have told my story before I even have to open my mouth. So, but yeah, I, I don't really mind. Have you been called a water missy yet? Oh, well, <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> oh, get ready for that. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you've written a book. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, you know, I think... Um, I think that's where I find it really hard as well, coming out of the forces, is getting that point where you say that I used to be, that little sentence, I used to be, is really hard to say. You know, I used to be a Chinook crew in, and people go, but yeah, but you're not now. And it's really hard to get your head around that veteran kind of, this is who we are now. And, mm. you know, I used to have this real vision that veterans were all these old crusty blokes who, you know, marched on remembrance someday. And I'm a veteran now, you know, I've been a veteran since it was like 37 or something. So, you know, I like, the, and veterans are becoming younger and younger now. There's more guys, you know, who have done their time in Herrick and seen some really nasty shit. <laughs> and now they're essentially veterans walking around the street, that, you know, some of them certainly, you know, five, six years ago were coming out at the age of 25, having had eight years of Herrick and, and really earned their worth. Um, and yeah, it's just veteran sounds like an old word, doesn't it? It does. It does. <laughs> The old crusties on well. on remembrance plate polishing their medals and yeah. <laughs> it's uh, um yes it would uh we need a new word that's what we need Chris you need to like put it out there in the audience and get a new word for veterans Young yeah veterans. no I'm just I'm trying not to sound like like old and sexist here but <laughs> if it if if or if half the veterans look like you it, it would be a different bloody day <laughs> no it's nice to not because, because i spent like my entire career in a flying suit covered in oil hydraulic fluid and oil i used to joke that om15 which is the hydraulic fluid on a chinook it used to just be my my perfume because I just always stank of OM15. So with helmet hair everywhere. And it's not a glamorous <laughs> job. I mean, being a crewman and humping and dumping most of the Marines in Paris kit on and off the aircraft in 40 degree heat and body armor covered in dust and sweat. It's not a glamorous job. But did it's they, like, what, what, did they ever were they ever surprised to see a female or was or, or... Yeah. Um yeah, I think so, because it wasn't, I, I was the only one for four years. And then even at our, our maximum, I think we had five of us. So mm -hmm. big scheme of things, it was, you know, we were really few and far between. But they, always were, they were always all right. I mean, there was always a bit of banter down the back of the chinook and whatnot. And there's a story in the book about one day I managed to, I was sitting on the ballistic panel on the ramp uh, beside the M60. And as I got up, I ripped my entire combat open at the back spent the entire day i tried to bodge tip them up with black nasty but it, it just kept opening so my entire day i spent tasking in helmand and every time we filled the cabin up with troops they would all be like pointing and laughing and i'd be like yes i know I fucking got my thong on show and then, yeah. but you know if it increased morale for a day then you know what? no one no one got hurt no one's pregnant but um yeah it was um yeah I, you know it was always a bit of a laugh and and I was never ever made to feel. Yeah, I was never, you know, a single out by my lads at work, and and equally every single squaddy and every single guy who flew in the back of the aircraft was always, you know, actually really quite respectful, but in a fun way. So I never had a problem. Yeah, so I have no 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 doubts about that. Liz, your book is Chinook Crew Chick. It's on Amazon. It's uh, awaiting. I guess you're waiting for the paperback version now. Yeah, so pen and sword are the publishers, and they've yeah. got Amazon keeps selling out, so it's actually better to go pen and sword. The publishers have got loads of stock. I mean, I can't really complain that Amazon keeps selling out. It's a good problem to have, but yeah. um, pen and sword um, have got yeah, and it's hard to back at the minute. It should be going to paperback at some point. Um, people keep asking if I'm doing an audio version, and I was like, with this voice, would people actually want that? <laughs> oh, oh, oh no, do it. I, it, it. It's a it's a great voice. And yeah. you should definitely do it because I tell you what, 
I, I love to read books. You know, I like I like the actual book. I don't even like I've got yeah. Kindle and I've read loads on Kindle, but I don't I'd rather read but when I'm out and about, if I'm painting the garden shed, I love to listen to an audio book in the background. Yeah. Or driving and it's a real big thing. And I I, I yeah, I, I, you do it. But you don't want someone else reading your book, right? I wouldn't want yeah. that. No, I hope I do it myself. And uh, I, I, write, I write a little poetry as well, so um, I'm trying to get some of my poems on published or at least on the radar of the British Legion, so that maybe they can be involved in Remembrance Day. But um, yeah, audiobook might be the next the next thing. So yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I said to you earlier, Liz, your future is incredibly bright. You know, you're very kind. No, no, no I'm I'm not kind. I'm just honest. It, it's <laughs> you know, you you you've just got a wealth of experience. You've got the great personality to put it across um you clearly are, are concerned about veterans and etc cetera, etc cetera. and just even on the speaking circuit um geez geez you know well, it's, it's trying to find that new path in life and i think a lot of us ex-forces people mm. i mean there's certain trades in the forces that are just cut and paste in the city life isn't there like you know pilots can most of the time walk in their pilot job you know drivers engineers chefs you know there's a direct translation there to city street but for my trade as a crewman you know and there's other things in the, like signalers you know there's not a direct read across into city street for them or even int um and crewman's the same unless some city person wants another uh, helicopter and that's why i got out i end up damaging my neck and, and couldn't fly again so you know unless i can find a civilian who wants someone to man a minigun at like you know the end of the channel tunnel or something then i'm pretty much gonna struggle to find a job so it's trying to find that new path in life but i think a lot of veterans a lot of ex-forces uh come out and feel the same you know it's just trying to find your new identity and your new purpose in life so hopefully the book might be enough to stick me onto a different path and, yes uh, no i i'm absolutely certain of it you know certain yeah. of it um your story is going to inspire people and um the fact that you're you're still here with us is yeah. uh is bloody great you know yeah. great yeah. what uh, it, liz is there anything you want to um uh to finish off with where where if let, let's just say someone wanted to book you as a speaker how how can they get hold of you so i recently joined twitter ah, against my better judgment and i'm on there as a uh, chili crew chick so you can look me up on twitter and i'm also on instagram as chinook crew chick so uh I kept it quite simple. It's the name of the book. It's the name of the Twitter account and the name of the Instagram account. But I'd love to hear from people. Um, I'd love to hear from people who have read the book as well and want to hear what they thought of it. Um, hopefully they enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm up for, you know, my starting my new path. So anyone who wants to get in contact, then please do. Brilliant. Brilliant. Liz, stay on the line. It's just been absolutely wonderful um, chatting to you blow me away to be honest it, 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 just incredible just absolutely incredible it's a pleasure um, yeah no mate 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 not absolutely my pleasure my pleasure to everyone at home massive love to you all as well if you can like and subscribe that would be really kind we'll put a link below for liz's book get on it <laughs> so what this is uh uh this is uh, this is a story story like no uh no no other really and um if you can like and subscribe did i probably just said that but <laughs> <laughs> anyway we'll see you soon thank you